In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Glory to Jesus Christ. What a poignant and telling image St. Luke paints for us today in this gospel the deacon has just read. Our loving Savior goes to teach in the synagogue and he encounters a woman that is bent all the way down, facing the earth. This word is poignant because it's such a direct illustration of sin, such a great depiction of our passion, about how we are when we are passionate. And when this woman is bent down, everything that she has faces the ground. The mind, the eyes, and even her heart, all of it is caught in the dirt. And so the mind that is bent down is occupied with things of the lowest order, transient things, mundane things, unimportant things, impure things, sinful things, irrational things. And if the head and the mind are bent down, then the eyes also are. And so instead of gazing up at God, gazing up at, at his creation, the eyes are caught down to the things that the mind directs it to face. And the heart too. The heart is also facing down. The heart being the throne of God rejects God. Instead of binding itself to holy things that the mind would give to it, bringing in wonderful concepts and, and giving meaning to them, the heart binds itself to whatever the mind shows it, whatever the eyes see. And if everything is down, then the heart also is down. And so instead of binding itself to what is holy, it begins to worship all the same things that the mind thinks about. The heart embraces them. Whatever the eyes and the mind look at, this is what the heart looks at. This is the state of the poor woman that Christ finds. This is the state of the world before Jesus was born. This is the state that we are in. And this is the state I am in. This is the state of a passionate person. Yet Christ, who is the expressed image of the Father, He has nothing crooked in Him. He is all good. He is the measure of all that is right. So when He comes, He straightens what is bent. If you want to straighten something, you better have a rule by which you can straighten it by. Otherwise, how do we know it's straight when it's not just bent more? And so when Christ comes, He sees the woman and He immediately straightens her. Just with so much love, He just immediately straightens her. And he can, because he is well, he is healthy. There's nothing irrational in him, nothing wrong with him. Everything is good, so he can heal. And he does. He has the perfect life, and with his life he can straighten all other lives that are not right. But then Christ ascends. Right? Christ is born, Christ dies, Christ is resurrected, then he ascends. And yet his life is still here, his life is still with us. He has extended himself through the Holy Spirit throughout the whole church. And so his life continues in the lives of the saints in the church. And his life is best expressed by the saints. The saints, my children, are so precious. They are so precious. Why? Because they express the life of Christ. They are so glorious because they express this life. But they have a double glory. The double glory they have comes because not only do they live as Christ does, but they become the rules by which Christ straightens others. They become his instruments by which we become healthy, by which we become straight. They become the measurements that we can look at and say, okay, how should I act? I will take his measurement and I will follow him. And today we celebrate a measure of measures, this Saint Saba, Sabas, Sabas, they're all the same, Saint Sabas the Sanctified. He is an amazing man. In fact, he and his monastery become the model for the whole church. The Tipicon we follow, what, what dictates how we fast, how we spend great Lent, that all comes from his monastery. His monastery became the rule for the whole world, for the whole church. And the whole church embraced his teaching, his typical. And he was the measure, the measure of righteousness. He is a great measure. And so he's a great example of what I'm speaking about. When he was eight, he went to the monastery. His parents let him go, and he went, and he became a monk. <laughs> I don't know if he became a monk. He went to the monastery at the age of eight, he fought against unbridled desire. And so when he was young, I don't know how young, he was in a garden, he was tending the monastery garden as a teen, as a young person, and he saw this apple that was so beautiful, and of course, tastes good. And so Saint Salvas looked at it and he said, I desire this, it's good to eat. And he says, I'm also working in the garden, so it's kind of my pay. And so he reached up and he grabbed it, and he began to put it in his mouth, and he began to taste it. 
And it's at that moment that he suddenly realized that he had committed a great sin because he didn't have a blessing for this. He hadn't asked permission of anyone to do this. And he suddenly realized, wow, he said, I've been beguiled by desire. And see, he was so young, but he was so wise in that he understood that this wasn't a small thing. He had completely given his will to this. And so he, he was amazed. He, he pulled the apple out of his mouth. He put it on the ground and he stamped on it. And he said, I will never eat apples again. Now that may seem extreme, but you have to understand his purity of heart and his love of God. And that he was amazed at how powerful sin was within him. That it would lead him this astray. When he was 16, he went to this man named Euthemius the Great. Euthemius was one of the greatest fathers we know. He is a massive teacher. And Euthemius loved this young boy. He just said, in fact, he said, this young man is a child elder, is what he called him. Because he was so advanced, even though he was just 16, he was so young. And because he was beardless, he would keep him in this special monastery. Not to scandalize anyone, because he was too young to have a beard. But when he would, when Euthemius would go out during Great Lent to asceticize in the desert, he would take him with him. He would take Savas with him, because he was so impressed with his holiness, with his way of life. Eventually, Euthemius prophesied, he said, you are going to build a great monastery, and it will be greater than the other monasteries, and you will become the leader of monastics. And then Euthemius died. And St. Savas went off and asceticized for a while, then he founded his own monastery, this great and wonderful Lava, Lava the uh, Marsava Monastery. It's very famous, and it still stands to this day. And his relics are there. However, this wasn't enough for St. Savas, and he saw that there was a mountain nearby that had a bad reputation. It was very demonic. In fact, Whenever priests do exorcisms, we actually say to the demons, go to some awful place, go to some desolate place, go to some cave. Like, get out of this person, and go to some awful place. And so this mountain was the awful place of the demons had been sent to. And it was right next to his monastery. And so he said, okay, I'll go live there. And so he went to live in this awful place, and all the demons were so upset because they had been kicked out of human beings, and they'd been sent to this mountain. And now this man is coming to live on their mountain. And they were really ticked, they were really upset. But he stayed there, and they left, eventually because his prayer was so powerful and God was with him that they left. And he built a second monastery on Mount Castilion. And he would send all the young monks there to be trained so they would learn how to be righteous, how they would learn how to be good. And St. Savas was very pure, but he was also very watchful over the purity of others. And so he had this disciple who was very young. And one day they went out for a walk to the Jordan. And they saw this big crowd of pilgrims. St. Savas was pure, and he saw there was a very beautiful girl in this crowd. Very beautiful. And St. Sava said to his young monk, he said, there's a girl in the crowd, but I think she is blind. What do you think? And the man said, oh no, Father, she is not blind at all. He says, huh, I could have sworn she only had one eye. He said, oh no, Father, she has two, and her eyes are glorious. And St. Sava said, hmm. He said, my child, don't be taken with concupiscence. You are gazing at things that will harm you. And the young monk was unbridled, and so he sent him to Mount Castilian to be trained. And when he came back, he was absolutely pure, like his master was. St. Savas had a lot of problems. In fact, they said he was very gentle with men, but he was very mean to demons, is what they said about him. But they said that at one point he had a rebellion of brothers against him that fought with him, that hated him. And they wanted him to be deposed. They wanted him to stop being out. And so he said, fine, I will. And so he left meekly to this cave that was, you know, a distance away. And it turned out the cave was the house of this lion who lived there. And so St. Savas went to the cave, he found this spot, and he laid down and went to sleep. And the lion came back from his hunt, and he found him there, except the lion knew who he was. And so the lion kind of pawed at him. He wouldn't wake up, so the lion grabbed his monastic cloak with his teeth and began to pull him gently out of his cave. And St. Savas woke up, and he said, what are you doing? He said, this cave is big enough for both of us. And he went back to the spot, and he prayed there. And the, and the lion went out, because he was saying his prayers. And when he was finished praying, the lion kind of came back in again, as if to say, no, you should leave. This is my house. And St. Saba said, to whom did God give his image? To me or to you? He gave it to me. I'm the higher order, so you should listen to what I say. And the lion bowed and left. Didn't come back to me. St. Saba returned at the desire of the brothers, but there was another big rebellion that happened. And a bunch of brothers hated him. They literally seethed with hate against this man. And they left. And they went to this nearby area this place nearby, but they had a lot of problems because they were disobedient, kind of corrupt people, bad monks, and so they had no food, they had nothing, and so they were in very bad states. And some men who saw them went to him and they said, Father, he said, the brothers who have rebelled against you, they're not doing so well. And St. Thomas says, okay. He says, I see. And so he saddled a whole bunch of mules, packed them with grain, with wheat, with wine, with oil, and he went to see them, and he gave them this food that they needed. 
And they hated him as he did this. They hated him, but he unloaded all of them. And he saw that they didn't have a church. They were praying in these awful little huts they had made. And so he said, it's okay. He said he came back with building materials and built them a church, even though they hated him. And they repented. They repented and they came to love him. And they probably went back to his authority. St. Savas did not have eyes that gazed down. He had eyes that gazed up. And one day, his steward came to him and was in a panic. He said, the granary is empty. We have no wheat. We have no flour. In fact, he said, we have no flour so much as to even make cross work of the liturgy. Father, you have to cancel the divine liturgy this Sunday. And St. Savas says, I will not cancel. I will not cancel the divine liturgy for this reason. I will not. And the steward... <laughs> <laughs> didn't know what to say. He said nothing. I don't know what day it was. Maybe it was Friday or something. And then on Saturday, this massive caravan of lay people came to the monastery with this huge load of wheat, with wine, with oil, with grain, with everything. And they unloaded it, and they filled the entire granary, and everything was necessary. And the steward came and bowed to him and wept. And he said, I'm a faithless man. Forgive me. And St. Sava raised him up again. He said, be, be not unbelieving, be believing, son. Believe. And he began to believe again. St. Sava's was so important because... At the time in which he lived, it was not a nice time. It was very crazy. And so there was all these heresies. And some of the hierarchs were heretics. The emperor was a heretic. There was all kinds of serious problems. And yet he would defy emperors. He would defy them to their face. And he would also defy patriarchs. He would actually guide the patriarchs and say, look, you need to repent. And patriarchs would trust in him. They would actually ask his blessing. They would ask his opinion. Even though he was a humble, just monk who lived in the desert, they would go to him and they would say, what is the right teaching? What you say, I will follow. And even the emperors would shake before him and they'd say, what you say we will do. And that's how it was. And so he became a literal guy, a literal model. You see, beloved, we have to be careful what we look at because anyone who's a craftsman, it doesn't matter what craft he does, if his tools are broken, what he makes will not be right. And so if a carpenter has bent tools and his level doesn't work, then how will he make anything straight? He can't do it. If a musician comes and he has a broken instrument or an instrument that is hideously out of tune and he tries to play, his tune will not be pleasing to anyone except a tone-deaf man. No one will care what he plays, and no one will want to hear it. And so we have to be careful what we bind ourselves to and what we, what we align ourselves with. Because there are many heroes in the world, men who have some virtues. But the problem is they're not all pure. They might have bravery, but they have many other problems. Or they might have ingenuity, but they have other problems. You have to fix your gaze on what is holy. You have to fix your gaze on the saints. If you don't, then your alignment will not be right. It will be something different. It will not be pure. Beloved, when we look at the, all the old pictures in the Psalter, you'll see all these holy men, and they're praying like this, and their eyes are lifted up to heaven. And that is where I, our eyes should be also. And when you see the ladder of divine ascent, this beautiful icon, which is kind of scary too, you see that all these men are ascending. And it doesn't matter which part of the ladder they're on, if they're at the bottom or if they're at the top, they're all looking up as they're climbing the ladder. Even the guy at the very bottom is looking up as he's trying to climb. The only men who are looking down on that ladder are those being pulled down by the demons. And so everyone's eyes should be up. And that's actually the teaching of Advent, the teaching of Nativity, this whole season, is look up. Who found Christ? Who was the one who found him? Or the shepherds. The shepherds weren't sleeping. Their eyes were open. And then the night they were gazing up at the stars, God's creation, glorifying God. And all of a sudden an angel appeared. And he proclaimed the good news to them. And then many angels appeared, and the shepherds were caught up in light and in glory. And what, what about the Magi who journeyed? They had refined their minds with wisdom. They had been obedient to Daniel. They had listened to his prophecies. And they gazed upward too. And they saw the star, which the Father said was actually an angel. That's where the star was. Because the star would move, and then it would stop, and then it would move again, until it was over the house where Christ was. And so the Magi were allowed to see an angel. They were given the grace to see him, because they gazed up because their minds have been purified with wisdom. And so this is the teaching of Advent. And that's why God gives us these massive saints during the season so we can look at them and realize how should we align ourselves so that we can see Christ when he comes. We should align ourselves like St. Sabas or like St. Nicholas whom we will celebrate tomorrow who's in even greater measure. And so, beloved, gaze up. Lift up your eyes and gaze up. Do not gaze at the earth, but gaze at the heavens where Christ will soon descend to you. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, may our eyes always be up, and may our attention always be fixed on Christ. Amen.